You could get a T-bone steak for 15 cents in 1936, if you had the 15 cents, and a new pickup would set you back all of $500. Missouri in 1936, 18th in population, with 3,800,000 people. Most of the state highways still were dirt or gravel roads. In many ways, Missouri still was a backwoods state, but the historic wealth of wildlife had almost vanished. 1936 was low ebb in the Missouri outdoors. Things were pretty tough back then. People did just about anything they wanted to do and were able to get by with. Timber was burned indiscriminately. Uh, farming, as far as erosion was concerned, uh, was a negative uh, thing. And people saw the outdoors as something merely to be used, to be exploited, and with hardly ever a thought toward the future. People were talking about the upcoming election in the coffee shops and on the spit and whittle benches. You could get six to one odds in Missouri that Roosevelt would beat Alf Landon. Newly invented Kodachrome film brought color to the world of photography. The national debt was $34 billion and there was a new Agatha Christie mystery starting in the Saturday Evening Post. A big Studebaker touring car was $665, but it had overdrive. Mules were big in Missouri. We sold 236,000 of them to the rest of the world in 1935. Voters may have thrilled to the gossip about King Edward VIII being in love with an American divorcee. There were rumors he might give up the throne for her. But what really touched them was down at the polling place. Election day, time for choices. Conservation consciousness ran deep in Missourians. They didn't talk much about it, but it was there. The big news on the 1936 ballot was the race between Lloyd Stark and Jesse Barrett. In Stark's hometown, Louisiana, the Press Journal endorsed Amendment 4, a plan to create a nonpartisan conservation commission. It cost you a dime to see Shirley Temple at the Clark Theater in Louisiana. In Columbia, the Boy Scouts distributed posters which urged voters to bring them back to Missouri. The them of the poster 
were deer and wild turkey and quail and raccoons and beavers. All animals once plentiful, all dwindled to a pitiful few by the 1930s. Deer hunters finished a three-day season and headed for the poles. There were only 3,000 hunters and they took fewer than 100 animals. On opening day, there were only seven deer reported taken statewide. Deer hunting clearly was no big deal in the Missouri of 1936. November 3rd, election day. It was cold and fair, and there was a heavy voter turnout. The Literary Digest had predicted a Landon victory. Not many voters took the Literary Digest, though, and when the votes were counted, Landon had suffered one of the worst defeats in history. And Amendment 4 was law. Missouri had a new conservation system, and America had the same president for another four years. Landon took his defeat gracefully. <laughs> he grinned and went duck hunting. Missouri's duck hunters, and everyone else, could only wait to see what kind of governmental adult this baby Department of Conservation would grow up to be. We figured anything the conservation did was better than what we had. The hills were gullied and you couldn't find deer or anything. Things were really in a mess. Conservation ideas change. The old Game and Fish Department newsletter reported in May of 1936 that Vernon County sportsmen had conducted a roving cat hunt and killed 11. And one Marmoton River floater reported shooting 75 turtles in a half mile of river. Another Missourian shot 217 hawks in 1935. Things have changed, and for the better. Some early statistics seem almost incredible today. 19 Missourians died in hunting accidents from October through December of 1935. Today, the hunting accident is rare, even with far more hunters in the field. While hunters are also a form of control. No one thing brought wildlife back in Missouri. It was attitudes and public sentiment. Most people weren't lawbreakers. Most people wanted the conservation department. They created it and voted for it. The Conservation Federation was formed in 1935 because of a need to take conservation out of politics. Wildlife resources had sunk to a real low, not just because of the management, but because of the droughts of the 30s. And the combination had wildlife probably in the worst shape that they'd ever been in. I'm from Cooper County, and we often said that when we were kids growing up, there wasn't a deer or a turkey in that whole county. And now we have both, and we have them right there on, on the home farm, and within a mile of my mom's home. There's no question but what Missouri is the envy of every state in the nation. The fact that Missouri is free of politics, that they have a bipartisan commission that can set rules and regulations based on the recommendations of wildlife and forestry managers, and the fact that uh, from the very beginning we have always had one of the top technical staffs in wildlife and forestry. There isn't any question but what we have the best conservation program in the nation. The Conservation Department plunged into the new world of modern conservation. It hired its first wildlife biologist in September of 1937. One observer said of Harold Terrell, his enthusiasm can light up a darkened room. Terrell spent 38 years with the Conservation Department. Everybody in the field at that time was dedicated and willing to work whatever time it took to, and under whatever conditions it took to get the job done. Professional resource management has grown up with Missouri's modern conservation. 
In fact, the two are intertwined for much of what now is standard practice nationally started here in Missouri. Before the new program could work, there had to be new rules and people to enforce them. Early agents got around any way they could. Convictions on wildlife violations often were hard to come by. After all, the poacher was just a good old boy, wasn't he? It was difficult to get around in the early days. And several agents that I know rode horses and owned horses, and they patrolled the woods. No one really had the right equipment. We just had whatever car or whatever thing we could get to get around in. I had an old magistrate judge who was a game law violator from way back, and he didn't sympathize with the department a bit. We bought a deer from a fellow one time, and we paid $50 for the deer, and the judge fined the guy $50 fine, so he paid with our money, <laughs> which is was a kind of a slap. We've got a good department. I love it. I will till the day I die. All rise, please. It was a hard, long fight to gain acceptance, but gradually the balance of tough, impartial law enforcement swung the other way. We started trapping deer on the Skaggs Ranch in Taney County, but uh, all we could trap with was does. We took them around to these refuges we'd already set up. The refuges had a, a number nine wire around them, and they were big. And they included a lot of private farms. Maybe one refuge might have two or three farms in it. But we'd contact the people in there, and oh, they thought that was wonderful. We'd tell them what we was doing. And they said, that we will help you watch the deer, so they won't know where to get them. That was only one of the early projects and early problems. We really had a hard row in, in the beginning because we were offering fire protection to mostly to private landowners, you know. In the first place, they, only a handful wanted it. And in the second place, those that did want it, that we offered it to, we weren't really equipped to give them fire protection. We did the best we could, but we didn't have the manpower or equipment. And it was the same way with, uh, with our conservation agents and law enforcement. Uh, they were so spread, so thin, that really and truly, even though we had the regulations, we had to depend on a lot of cooperation from a lot of Missouri citizens. This was what the people had voted for, but it took a while. We just didn't have the funds to do it with and the people to do it with. It's hard today to realize how tough conditions were for field people in those first years. In the early days, in fact, uh, it was actually dangerous to wear that uniform in some parts of the county. I recall a case I had in, in circuit court and I appeared in my nice blue shiny uniform with, uh, and the prosecuting attorney said, uh, you better go back home and put on a pair of overalls. He said, they'll try the uniform. They'll not try the case. They'll try the uniform. And one of our uh, agents uh, attempted to apprehend some saners. And uh, when he uh, reached for the sane, one of them took the braille and started beating him, and they almost beat him to death. I knew that we could not get this job done if we didn't all work together, all have the same idea. We all had to, we had to be loyal, we had to be dedicated, and we had to forget about our own self and make sacrifices, whether it was long hours or salaries, we had to get the job done. Maybe Minnesota is the land of 10,000 lakes, but Missouri is the land of farm ponds and the hundreds of thousands. 
The Conservation Department first loaned out an old scraper to help landowners dig ponds in 1939, and it began offering free fish to put in them in 1942. Going fishing all of the time, baby. Going fishing too. Bet your life, your sweet wife, you catch more fish than you. Now the fish bites if you got good bait. Here's a little tip I like to relate with my pole and my line. I'm a going fishing, yes, I'm going fishing, and my baby going fishing too. Went on down into my favorite fishing hole, baby, grab me a pole line. I throw my line on in to the bottom, though I got a man, carry him home to mama by my supper time. Almost forgotten today are many of the early problems, including some that were political rather than resource-oriented. The new Conservation Commission was tested right from the start. Did it have authority to appoint a non-resident director? I.T. Bodie was from Iowa, stern and dedicated, tough and strong. He had to be. Did the commission have the authority to make wildlife regulations? Or could anyone get his two cents worth in? There were repeal attempts for four legislative sessions, and the citizens flooded their representatives with support for the program they'd created. There was a strong repeal attempt in 1940, but it was soundly defeated by the voters. Finally, Missouri's conservation program was free of its childhood ailments, ready to grow and thrive. But there was a far larger problem on the horizon, one that affected a nation. While World War II was a nightmare for the country, it was a vacation for wildlife. A generation of hunters went to war. There were fewer farmers to work the land. Wildlife thrived under benign neglect. breathing room for critters. Much of the hunting during the war years uh, actually was local hunting, simply because of the problems of travel at that time and getting sufficient gasoline and tires. We did have some problem getting um, ammunition. Uh, I can remember that uh, stores would advertise a certain amount of ammunition that would be available and uh, immediately we would get lineups of people uh, trying to buy uh, a box of shotgun shells. So there was also difficulty in, in being able to obtain ammunition. Nineteen forty three. The war in Europe was beginning to turn but the war in the Pacific still was a bitter stalemate. Preston Foster and Brenda Joyce starred in Little Tokyo, USA at the Club Theater in Granby. Adults had to pay 22 cents to get in, but it cost the kids only a dime. The war was the only real news. Meat rationing was in, but game and fresh fish were exempt. Cars were expensive, and you couldn't get them. Travel was tough, but they were expecting a big opening day crowd at the Missouri Trout Parks. Maybe nothing shows the face of Missouri conservation better than the trout parks. But you're going fishing all of the time. 
They're a universal experience. The opener still is March 1st, and it still attracts a cross-section of Missourians. Modern conservation technically was 10 years old in 1946, but it really still was a babe. Five years of war had virtually cut that decade in half. What we know today really started when Johnny came marching home again. They established a series of forest refuges and the intent was to build up deer populations to the point where they could be trapped and transported to other parts of the state. What they would do, they would bait an area with corn usually and then after the deer began using this particular area, they would set a box trap over it, a big box with doors on both ends that, that would drop when a deer tripped the wire in the middle. Then the trick was to get the deer out of the trap and into a small holding crate. Many times these fellows had to do this for themselves. They would put the box up against the end of the trap, ease the door up and set it down on the backboard and raise the door on the box. Then they would go around and get in the other end of the trap and push the deer into the box. And if you've ever been confined with a deer in a small area, you, this takes guts. Roy Rogers and Trigger were in Rainbow Over Texas at the Orpheum Theater in Hannibal. The United Nations was working on guidelines for the control of the atomic bomb, that frightening new weapon. General Dwight Eisenhower said there was no possibility he would ever be associated with political office. And Hank Greenberg hit his 44th home run on September 27th. Duck decoys were $12.50 a dozen. Merrimack Spring wasn't yet a public trout fishing area in 1950, but about 3,000 anglers showed up at the other three trout parks for the traditional March 1st opener. Maybe some at Roaring River looked apprehensively over their shoulders because there was a news report of a black panther in the Monette area. Then at spring fishermen staying in Lebanon could see Abbott and Costello in Africa Screams at the Star Theater and cook up a 69 cent a pound sirloin steak. The Brooklyn Dodgers were favored to take the National League pennant. Missourians enjoyed their outdoors that opening year of what we now call the Decade of Peace. But it proved not so peaceful. The future seemed bright early in the year, though. The Lebanon record headlined the imminent end of the Korean War. Oh, the French were in trouble in some far-off place called Indochina, wherever that was. But not to worry. In mid-October, things looked good. The trout parks had entertained a record number of anglers. The country was saddened when Al Jolson died on October 24, 1950. In Korea, the Red Chinese fired at U.S. Marines. Drought plagued Missouri. More than 15,000 acres burned in Laclede County alone. The quail season was expected to be excellent.
The decade of war wound down and Missourians turned to their outdoors, one that had existed at little more than subsistence level for many years. Soon there was an uneasy peace in Korea, and there was a ferment of wildlife innovation in Missouri. Those were exciting days. So new was wildlife management that anything was worth trying. Dick Vaught, retired wildlife biologist, started with the conservation department in 1948, and he paid his dues over the years. I went to work on the bush area for a year or so, and then, and then the, we built a new area up in northwest Missouri called the Trimble Wildlife Area. And uh, while we were developing that area, we found some geese that we thought were different than the normal geese that we see that migrated to the state. And they were on a farm between Columbia and, and Jefferson City. And uh, Paul Talenko, at that time, was the, was the wildlife division chief. And he had picked up an article someplace, and the article was concerning some Canada geese that nested on high elevated areas. Some of them were nesting on top of haystacks. And when I read this, I thought, well, maybe these geese really would, would like to nest in elevated places. So I started building tubs, and we built tubs and put them out. And the first year we put the tubs up, those geese were fighting over them, and it's automatic, you know. And it, these birds were all pinion birds. They couldn't fly, so we had to build catwalks, you know, from the water up to the edge of the tub. And, uh, and it was amazing to watch those birds walk up those catwalks and, and jump in those tubs. And, and, and We'd learned how to make things happen from wartime production to a bomb that could destroy the world. And we were flexing our muscles, changing the face of the world. The 1950s were the era of the big lakes in Missouri. A seven mile long belt conveyor in Arkansas moved four million tons of Lee Mountain to create a dam on the White River. They planned to call it Bull Shoals. Yet to come were Table Rock, Stockton, Palm de Terre, Long Branch, Cannon, and Truman Dams. But it wasn't entirely a big lake decade. The first community lake of 30 acres was built near Jamesport in 1955, and the first river access dipped into the Big Piney in 1958. Also yet to come were new fish. Striped bass, muscalunge, hybrid trophy fish, and a trophy trout program that jumped the state record over 15 pounds. The 1950s, happy days. Bobby Sox and Pat Boone. Missouri deer hunters got ready for a landmark 1951 season. The first one in modern times when does were legal. And it was just kind of a rule of thumb that we had that after a county had been stocked for five years, that it would be open for hunting. If we see the 50s as a time of peace and stability, the 60s were anything but. The world was picking up steam by 1962. Lots on Lake Tanicoma were $800 each. A three-bedroom, brand new, all-electric home in Branson sold for $14,000. Hamburger cost 41 cents a pound. 
They were hiring men to build campgrounds on the Mark Twain National Forest. And the Branson Beacon was urging people editorially to support the Conservation Federation. It's been a wonderful thing that, to think that they can bring turkey and deer and now maybe grouse and some other species back from almost extinction. It's been great. To halt this offensive buildup, a strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba is being initiated. All ships of any kind bound for Cuba... It was 1962. The United States and Russia were circling each other like strange dogs, growling over the presence of Russian missiles in Cuba. Remember? We are not at this time, however, denying the necessities of life, as the Soviets attempted to do in their Berlin blockade of 1948. Whale had bounced back remarkably after the winter of 1960 and 61, which still ranks as one of the worst in recorded history. Hunters who'd sold their dogs now were trying to find any old egg sucker to hunt behind. The conservation department was looking for young men to become conservation agents. My, how things have changed. The training program that the agent trainees go through is very thorough. It's four and a half months of training, and we are taught not only the laws of the, the uh, Wildlife Code of Missouri, we're taught with self-defense training, firearms training, and uh, proper search and seizure, proper handcuffing, vehicle stops. So they do cover a wide range of uh, not only the technical part of it, but the physical part of it, too. We have acquired, um, of course, better vehicles to get around in to do our work. Many of them are four-wheel drive now, and uh, the agents that have a, a lake area or a river area have better equipment for working that. We also have a better communication system with our radios now, so this has enabled us to do our job more effectively and more safely. halfway through the tumultuous 60s. Eggs were 39 cents a dozen and coffee, 65 cents a pound. Meanwhile, Missouri's conservation program was at a critical stage. We just didn't know it yet. The historic goals of the 1930s were nearly realized. Deer, turkeys, beavers, and raccoons were back. Now there were thousands of farm ponds, stocked free of charge with Department of Conservation fish. The community lake system brought good fishing close to home. Effective forest fire control was a reality now, not a dream. Eventually, it got to the point where people realized that what we were trying to do, and we got a lot of cooperators initially then lined up, and you'd go in on a fire, and you might find a farmer or two or maybe three or four, and, they were, and we'd have the equipment where they would be out there beating it with gunny sacks. We'd have some equipment, and they'd jump in and help put it out. Ten, nine, ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. We had faith that whatever the future, Missourians would shape it. We were in space, and we had our eyes on the stars. at other worlds. It's also looking at the one where we live. For conservationists, the 70s was the decade of the tax. 
Missouri's nationally unique sales tax for conservation. The first petition efforts started in 1970, and it was 1977 before the tax went into effect, nearly the entire decade. Missourians once again put their money with their heart. The conservation tax brought the outdoors to all Missourians, not just hunters and fishermen. And it has been another 10 years since. Much has happened. The face of the world has changed. Countries have risen and fallen. Still, old truths remain. Old rituals play themselves out and nature renews itself. Missouri conservation today is a mix of sunshine and rain. We have new places to go, far-reaching programs for everyone. But we also have pollution and land abuse and vanishing wildlife habitat. Is today's conservation the little Dutch boy with his finger in the dike? Or will the land and those who love it prevail? 50 years. The torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans. To the ultimatum, and that Britain and Germany were at war. Distinction, being the only nation in the history of the world that ever went to the poorhouse in an automobile. In other words, old radio programs never die. <laughs> I know one that dies every Tuesday night. I believe that a man can be a liberal without being a spendthrift. That the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Bringing you a special news bulletin, the Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii by air, President Roosevelt has just announced. A landing was made this morning on the coast of France by troops of the Allied Expeditionary Force. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. We believe that peace is at hand. Free at last! Free at last! Thank God Almighty! We are free at last! But old soldiers never die. They just fade away. And 50 years of conservation. I just feel like that uh, we've done a tremendous job uh, under all types of adversities, and, and I see nothing but uh, improvement in the future. I think that the people are better educated, and I think there's more of a conscience, a conservation conscience in the people today than there was 50 years ago, much more. I enjoy being out of doors and, and getting to see wildlife as well as helping to manage the wildlife resource and also the human resource. We were spread so far and so thin that we all had to help each other. We've got a good department. I love it. And I will till the day I die. And now we head across the hills into the second half century. <laughs>